All right. Okay. So on Thursday of last week, we talked about some of the economic systems that emerged from the Industrial Revolution. So think back to this last Thursday here about these economic systems. We already mentioned one quite a bit already. Adam Smith, what was it? What, what economic system had Oscar? Capitalism, you have a job. So think about capitalism, think about the pros, the, uh, the advantages to it, the uh, the benefits of the capitalist system. Then think of some disadvantages. What else do we talk about? What was another one? What's another economic system? Go ahead, Matt. Socialism, Socialism you have a job. So again, think of the uh, advantages, the disadvantages of having, let's say, a socialist system. And we finally talked about, uh oh, is that red font? We also talked a little bit about communism. Oh, look out. So oh, think about communism here, okay? And think about just really how the government control of uh, all goods, all products, when it comes to supply, demand, pricing, right? Oh, really? Okay, all right, so let's get working on this bell ringer here. Today is the 17th. I'm thinking we might be able to finish up this chapter by the end of the week. Because I just got to talk about German unification, which I'm going to try to get through today, post tomorrow, okay. And then throughout the rest of the week, we're going to talk about imperialism. And we have the game, the scramble draft of the game. Ooh, hopefully you guys have fun with that soon. Then after that, we'll have our test, which will start against the next week, we'll have a review and then the exam. We're jumping right into World War One. Bless you.
Bless you. Do you need another minute? All right, one more minute. Bless you. Everybody's sneezing. All right, okay. So the economic systems we talked about on Friday, Thursday, cheaper Thursday, last week. Uh, we started off with one that we talked about already this class when we got to the Enlightenment thinkers. So who was that that brought up this capitalist system? What was his name? Remember? What was his name? Remember, I told you to take a yes out of the last name and put something else the dollar sign. Go ahead. Patents. Adam Smith, yep, good job. So he talked a little bit about this with the wealth of nations, okay? And what's this hands-off approach? What's this invisible hand? What was that term? Yeah, it looks good. Go ahead, Oz. Laissez-faire. fair yep, good job, good job. So with this invisible hand, the government should stay out of the work of the economy. So when it comes to supply, demand, pricing, who determines that? Well, it's definitely not the government, right? This is up to the private businesses. This is up to the marketplace, really, when it comes to these sort of factors that play in this economic system. All right, so overall with a capitalist system, you have competition, right? You have these private organizations, these private businesses all duking it out for the best innovative product and the one that consumers will buy the most. So with this system, this is automatically gonna drive these prices down, okay? Uh, when you get to talk a little bit more about the progressive era eventually and the Gilded Age during United States history uh, and US too, uh, we'll mention quite a bit about how these monopolies started to form, how these big business owners started to buy up the competition and causing a lot of issues to the marketplace when it comes to wages. So, yeah, there could be some down effects to capitalist system uh, when it comes to these business owners, and these strong industrial titans of the time and giants of the time that are buying up the competition, setting the prices then to whatever they want because there is no competition, right? But in any case, with capitalism, if there is some sort of regulation, there will be a benefit to all workers, give more opportunities to people, drive prices lower. And it strives for what? Innovation, right? It strives for more uh, and stronger products to emerge under this economic system. All right, uh, what about some of other disadvantages of a capitalist system? What else do we have? What else do we have? Other disadvantages. Anything. Yeah. All right, so communism talks quite a bit about this, right? You're going to have a status, right? You're going to have an economic class systems where you have a higher class, right? The greedy, the, 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 the higher business owners, the industrial giants, let's say, right, that are buying up the competition. They are the ones controlling a lot of the wages, the prices, and when it comes to these unsafe, unsanitary conditions of work, well, it's like they have full control. Now, when it comes to politics at the time, because they have so much wealth, they can control and dictate what goes on in the political atmosphere to help grow their business even more. So, yeah, when you think of this class system that emerges from a capitalist system, that's something you can detail about disadvantages. That's something that you can mention quite a bit about how this might cause some issues or problems moving forward. And with the United States, as it goes through this progressive era, even still to this day, now when it comes to taxes, when it comes to uh, regulations in the workplace, Right, the government's trying its best to try to regulate some of these 
really cutthroat um, systems and cutthroat practices by these wealthy of the uh, OE class. All right, so yeah, the class system is something you mentioned quite a bit about. Um, other disadvantages, like I said early on, before government regulated uh, the marketplace here and, 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 and the workplace, it was kind of survival of the fittest, right? And how these monopolies formed as these business owners were just buying up their competition. Right now, with government regulation, that's harder to do. That's almost impossible to do, right? But in many cases, when it comes to a strong, growing business, they do have a lot of influence, a lot of power. All right, uh, socialism. What do we have for socialism? What do we got? Socialism. So, Chris, go ahead. When the community runs the economy. All right, yeah, good job, right? So this is equality amongst the board, right? You're trying to eliminate this class system. And you're trying to solve some of the issues, let's say, that capitalism brings out. And with that, with a socialist system, you have higher taxes. You have stronger government regulation. And with these higher taxes, this is supporting more when it comes to, uh, let's say, a healthcare system, when it comes to safer practices in the workplace, when it comes to free education, right? These are all benefits of the socialist system. One thing to note, though, is that with higher taxes, that's going to cause some issues for people when it comes to affording uh, many goods and products, right? And at the same time, with these business owners that are taking the risk, and uh, trying to create a new innovative company or business, right? Do they have that extra capital if they are being taxed pretty heavily by the government? Paul? No, right? So that's going to be a problem when it comes to innovation. So when you're thinking about disadvantages of a social system, you're not going to have near enough innovation as what you would in a capitalist system, right? Yeah, you're eliminating this class structure. You make it equal across the board. But at the same time, when it comes to disadvantages, that's really pulling a lot of the innovation out of the means of uh, the, the future progression of, let's say, a country. So with socialism, yeah, there are some drawbacks to it. One of the biggest things is with these higher taxes, that really reduces the capital for some of these business owners to take more risks and open up more companies and try to expand their products and make things a little bit more convenient. All right, and then finally, we have communism, right? Communism. So who wrote the Communist Manifesto? Who wrote it? The term, the term on Thursday. Connor, go ahead. Karl Marx. Yeah, Karl Marx, right? Okay, so he talked a lot about how he totalitarian. Okay, the totalitarian is known as the what? Working class or the business owners here? The elite. What is it? Totalitarian. Parker. The working class. Yep, good job. Then you got the bourgeoisie, right? The bourgeoisie. Okay, what is the bourgeoisie? That is the only other class, right? You have the elite business owners, right? You have these people that have pretty much all the capital within these systems. And with Karl Marx, he's predicting that eventually, with this class structure and uh, you know, and, and the, the the harsh demands on the proletariat, they will rise up and take over and try to fight for a more equal solution when it comes to control in the marketplace. When it comes to benefits to all classes rather than just, let's say, the elite of the bourgeoisie. So with communism, yeah, this is this viewpoint where you'll have government control of everything, right? Of everything. One thing to note here with government control of everything, is there any competition in the workplace then? Is there? No, right? These businesses, these private-owned businesses don't have a means of competing because there is one, right? The government controls all means of production. So when it comes to setting prices, well, it's set at whatever the government wants. It's not going to drive down or go up higher. Okay, depending on the time, sure. that again might happen when it, when, it, uh, when it comes to inflation. But the government predicts that, not the marketplace. So, yeah, it's going to cause some hardships for people when it comes to affording products and goods. Uh, what about the unique products and goods that you might have? Well, it's only one style, right? Only one model, let's say it's the cars. Yeah, that's it. That's it. The United States here, this capitalist system, we have a pick of whatever vehicle we want. And, uh, you know, model, type, color, you name it. But in a communist country, that's not the case. That's not the case at all. So that's one of the biggest issues, disadvantages is of communism, as there's no competition. The prices are set by the government. Okay, they have a full means control of everything. When it comes to prices, when it comes to demand, supplies, you name it. All right, okay, so as we're moving closer to World War I, think about communism here and how this was predicted to take over. 
right, with Russia. Okay, we'll talk how they withdraw from World War One, and they obviously turn into the Soviet Union as they're accepting communism as their form of political structure. But uh, with that, okay, think about nationalism though. Okay, as we're moving into German unification, you'll have Prussia unifying Germany, and nationalism kind of takes hold of this popular ideology challenging communism, kind of disproving Karl Marx's theories and beliefs of what will happen uh, with the future here. So here are your terms for today. All right, we got the German Confederation, Otto von Bismarck, real politic, Austro-Prussian War, Kaiser Wilhelm the First, Alsace Lorraine, and you got the Franco-Prussian War. All this sauce and Lorraine. Oh, just joke, just joke. All right, there are your terms. There are your terms. Like I said, I'm going to try to get through this German unification today. Um, if I can't, well, we'll just continue tomorrow. But I want to try to finish this chapter up by the end of the week here, so we can get moving right into World War One.
<clears throat> Do we need another minute? Okay. All right, okay, so German unification. All right, so after the Congress of Vienna, after the Napoleonic Wars, right, you see that Europe's going through a lot of transitions. And with the Congress of Vienna, what was that trying to do again? What was that trying to do? The leaders that were at the Congress of Vienna, what were they trying to do? What were they trying to do? So, some, some. Connor, go ahead. Yeah, good job, right? So after a lot of these democratic views and liberal views were expanding all throughout Europe, after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, it was up to these monarchs to try to bring stability and structure back to Europe. And the way to do that is, well, bring back absolute monarchies. Well, that's not going to really uh, you know, be solidified. That's not going to cause a lot of structure for here on out. As people get a taste of these freedoms, as people get a taste of liberties and uh, having these opportunities they never had before, it's not like they want to just go back to this feudal state, right? This feudal system, right? They want to try to transition and look more to more of a democratic structure of society. So with that, Germany, well, they're going through a lot of hardships after this Congress of Vienna. Okay, after Napoleon was defeated, well, they needed to come through and come together in order to be a dominant power in Europe and obviously the world. So the German Confederation was formed after the Napoleonic Wars, okay? Okay, these German-speaking entities, which at the time, there was close to 360 of them, very jam-packed in the middle of Europe. Can you imagine that? 360 small entities that speak a very similar language, have a similar culture, and they're just not joined together, not unified just yet. Right? And uh, with that, okay, this is going to cause leaders like Otto von Bismarck to try to step up and bring these German-speaking entities together. He realizes if we stay separated, and have these bitter rivalries between each other, there's no way we can rival let's say, Germany as a power, as in an elite world power, okay? So Bismarck, the only way he can do that is to try to show these German-speaking entities that they have this true power within. Uh, a lot of it because, we already mentioned it, where did that second wave of the Industrial Revolution start? Where did it happen, Paul? Germany, right? Yeah, so they already have a lot of these innovations there. It's just now, let's unify together, utilize our population, our resources, and join as one. And it's obviously easier said than done, because a lot of these small German-speaking entities were just focused on their own, focused on themselves internally. And this idea of community is nuts, right? It is nuts. That's why when you look at the United States with this federal system, federalism, okay, this allows for these communities to have elected officials that reach their values. You go to the next community over, it might be totally different. And uh, that's obviously beneficial. But with that, okay, for uh, for Germany, there is a rise of nationalism, a national pride that emerges after the Napoleonic Wars. And along with other countries, they help defeat 
strongest land power in the world at the time, which was Napoleon and France. Okay. And at the same time, they need to come together and try to unite people with a common culture. So, you guys ever hear of Snow White, Seven Dwarves? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, types of entertainment right like that and folk tales, fairy tales like this is going to inspire people to obviously have a form of the community. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Bambi before, right? Yeah. Bless you. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. Bambi for Austrian, but in any case, this is helping unite people in Central Europe with a common culture. Okay. We already talked about England already with Shakespeare and how that brought a sense of culture to England way back when, right during this Renaissance period. Now Germany needs to do the same. How are you going to build national pride? Well, you have to have a sense of culture, right? And at the same time, you have to have innovation. You have to have a strong military. And that's what Bismarck's going to bring to Germany to help unify all of these small German-speaking entities together. So this German, this, uh, German Confederation forms after this obviously the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, they're not just yet unified, right? They're building a sense of nationalism. They're building a sense of culture that eventually some will have to come around and bring them all together, which is going to be Otto von Bismarck. All right, so this quote here I thought was interesting. Who wants to read? Connor, you're the quote reader in here, so you might as well just read it for us. All right. The great questions of the time are not be resolved by speeches and majority decisions. That was the great mistake of 1848 Oh my gosh, iron and blood. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Well, anyway, with Otto von Bismarck, he talked quite a bit about how after the Napoleonic Wars, Germany, all these German-speaking states went through uh, a lot of rebellions, a lot of revolts. So what type of political structure should they have? Should they return back to the old system with an absolute leader? Well, a lot of people wanted it, some people did. Okay, most of the people did not. They had a, obviously these opportunities, these increased freedoms. And they don't want to get rid of it. But with Bismarck here, after viewing some of these revolts and rebellions that were happening in the 1840s, he said, yeah, you know what? Democracy is one thing. That's great. Okay, But in order to try to bring people together, we need to have a strong military. We need to have a means of power that is going to eventually bring this unification to happen. That's why when you're going over your terms, you saw a couple wars there. And a couple of wars that were challenging some of the great powers in Central Europe. And that's exactly what Bismarck utilizes to help bring this German unification. What better way than beating up your neighbors in warfare, right? That's exactly how he does it. So another form of politics that he brings to the stage, which you really haven't seen too much, especially under this absolutism, this real politique, right? Real politique just means that you're leaving out ideologies. It's not like you have a form of ideology as your base. It's just that you're making decisions that make sense. The plain and simple, right? If there's resources and materials that you'd like to conquer, that you'd like to grab, well, you do it. You build up the military to do so. If there is an alliance that will help you, benefit you in a war, in a conflict, well, you seek out that alliance. You weigh out the pros and cons. And before this, with politics, obviously, it was just made by one person, the absolute leader. You think about politics today. There's a lot of bickering, a lot of problems, a lot of flip flops. Of course, there is. With real policy, it's just kind of you're cutting out the ideology and you're thinking about, well, what just makes sense at the time? What's going to propel us as a world power? That's what we're going to do. And that is the sense of what? It's that term I told you to remember ever since the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Since then, Parker. Nationalism, yeah, good job. So with nationalism, Bismarck's utilizing this idea to try to bring stability, bring structure to Germany. He's saying, hey, we have this vast system of railroads that connect our country. No other country in Europe has this. We have innovations that are sporting that we literally, uh, no other country has these innovations just yet. We are utilizing a means of military. Again, these are European countries kind of left behind or don't even have. If we just come together, if we unify, we're going to be a world power that's going to be unstoppable. And that's kind of how he brings these German-speaking entities together. So he does so, again, through warfare, right? Through warfare. What better way to try to spur up nationalism, bring these German-speaking territories, entities together, than just winning a war against your neighbors? So the Danish, the Danish War in 1864, Prussia, which Otto von Bismarck is the chancellor of, he's the leader of. As you can see, Prussia is focused here, right here on the Baltic Sea, 
I'll get more closer to Russia. You can see obviously right here in purple. It's also a part of Prussia on the other side of Germany, connecting to France and Belgium. So, yeah, if you're focusing on in the internal part of Germany, these other German speaking entities, you're just going to conform to whatever Prussia wants. And the reason for it is because they have all the advancements. When you think of the innovations, the military tactics, the military weaponology of World War I and World War II, it all stems from Prussia and Otto von Bismarck. So, Bismarck realized it's the only way we can rise as a world power too is obviously to unify and at the same time bully around our neighbors. What better way to have access to the seas than taking on Denmark, right? So, Denmark's this small country that's right up here, right at the top of the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. They're right up top on a little short spike. Anyway, with Prussia, okay, in this Danish war, they now have heavy access to the North Sea, the Baltic Sea. And what do you think they're going to use that? Water access for trade, right? They're going to utilize that to maybe expand when it comes to imperializing other areas around the world, especially in Africa. Uh, at the same time, they can challenge who is the top dog with their navy at the time. Who is the top dog in the world with their strong navy? Go ahead, why? Great Britain, yeah, good job. So, this will spur an arms race, a naval arms race, eventually here, between Great Britain and Germany. And that's going to show the two elite powers of the time building up to World War I. All right, also, okay, after they win this Danish war, they kind of unify these countries all here in northern Germany, right? They unify them all, okay? It just shows to them that we are a successful power. We just join together. We use our resources, materials together. We can really achieve and accomplish anything. All right, but that wasn't enough. Right? These southern German-speaking entities still needed some sort of uh, influence, needed some sort of motivation. So, well... Bismarck thought another way to try to get involved and bring these southern German speaking entities together is duke it out with the next largest power here in Europe, Central Europe. That is Austria, right? That is Austria. So, this Austria, this uh, Austro Prussian War kicks off right around the mid 1860s, and Bismarck again is leading the charge. The reason for it is because he wants to try to bring all these German speaking states together. Right, and another name for the Austro-Prussian War, make sure you guys write this down, it's called the Seven Weeks War. Why do you think it's called the Seven Weeks War? Yeah, okay, yeah, so it lasts about seven weeks here. It didn't take too long for Prussia to take over Austria, right? They utilize the railroad systems interconnecting with transportation to their advantage. They're mobilizing armies at the border of Austria before Austria can even get their troops to the border. Right? And uh, they're utilizing this transportation to their advantage. Not any other country, even in the world at this time, even the United States had this interconnection of the railroad system. But with these German speaking states, with Prussia leading the charge, they could do so. And they were literally catching their enemies, their neighbors, with their pants down around their ankles, so to speak. Right? Yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So there, yeah, they're, they're surprising them just with the vast mobilization of troops. Of an all, a whole army, all at once, supplies materials by utilizing the railroad system. Austria didn't have that. When we talk about France, they didn't have that. So this allowed for Prussia to take over this land pretty quick, efficient, and in a matter of time. All right, so with that, here's just more of a look of what we're talking about. Okay, with this Denmark, okay, the wars with Denmark, and then here's Prussia, here's Austria, obviously. So with Prussia, they're trying to unify all these countries, all well, these German-speaking entities together by, well, going to war with your neighbors. Right? One other war that they're going to get involved with is obviously France, right? France was this dominant power for so long. We talked about Napoleon quite a bit already, right? And we mentioned about how France was the strongest land army in Europe at the time, in the world at the time. So with that, well, Bismarck thought, what better way now to try to unify all the German-speaking states and at the same time solidify Germany as the next rising world power than defeating France in a war? And that's exactly what he does. So in a way, he sends his troops by utilizing the what? What do you think he uses for transporting materials and armies? Go ahead, Paul. Railroad. Yeah, the railroad system, right? Utilizes this railroad system to move, move and mobilize his army along the France border, especially here with Alsace Lorraine, which I'll show you a picture here soon of what that looks like. And he conquers the territory pretty quick. He marches his troops into Paris, 
and orders France, Napoleon III at the time, to give up, to surrender. Okay, and with that, that finally solidifies the unification of Europe. Bismarck uses the resources, the materials, the railroad system, the interconnection of this transportation, this strong military, the new innovations of the time of the second wave of the Industrial Revolution, to his advantage to finally unify Germany as one. Now, as Germany is unified after defeating France within, this was literally a couple weeks, well, now he has the ability to rise Germany even more as a world power, to challenge Great Britain, and okay, challenge Great Britain. So with that, taking this territory of Alsace Lorraine, this is that small territory between Germany and France, this is going to spark a lot of tensions leading up to World War I. It's going to cause a lot of conflict leading up to World War I. And as Germany is rising as a power, well, now they can challenge Great Britain as who is the most dominant power in the world. Obviously, that's going to lead to another conflict, which we know is World War I. But the way they did it, it was kind of interesting. They actually made France make the first move. They thought, well, why not try to trick Boeing the III into sending in armies into this territory, which we kind of had rightful uh, land over, rightful power over. And, well, he just sends his, mobilizes troops with the railroad system and takes over France pretty quick. Right, rather than just taking all the land of France, he just wanted to make sure, Audubon Bismarck, he wanted to make sure that he could leave a statement for the rest of the world. It's not like he just claims Paris. It's not like he claims France as his, as his own. Right? He just says, I just wanted to make a statement. I wanted to show that we could unify these German-speaking states by taking on and challenging these rival neighbors and just to bring the country together. So he didn't really take too much land, just all of say Lorraine, that's it. He didn't take Paris. He didn't take the capital. He just wanted to show Germany that if they all come together, they can do great things, that they can be the next world power. All right, so with that, Bismarck realized he's getting too old, so they needed to have an emperor, a leader, uh, and they call him Kaiser Wilhelm I, which just means king, pretty much, all right, which just means king. All right, so with the German Empire moving forward, right, you have Kaiser Wilhelm I leading the charge. He is the leader. He's the monarch. He's the king. And with that, he's in, with, uh, with Germany now unified as a country. They're going to look for alliances that will connect them to be even stronger, be more powerful in Central Europe. One where it just won't topple after a little bit of time. One that will maybe challenge Great Britain and its power moving forward. So with Italy, Italy is going through somewhat of the same unification process. Well, why not have access in the seas in the north, right around Great Britain, and have access where? The Mediterranean Sea, right? And control trade all throughout Africa, Asia, Middle East. Europe, you name it. All right, so we'll talk more about this tomorrow and move into imperialism. All right, good luck.